uh, before I was coming in here and invited to speak by Mark, I was thinking about the history of uh, diplomatic relations of various artists, and we're a long ways away from Rubens and Velazquez, who were actually, a, you know, negotiated peace treaties with warring nations back in the 1700s. I don't think you're, you're going to send an artist anywhere now to work out any kind of peace treaty, uh, this, this situation, except in the classroom. I'm originally Canadian, and uh, where I come from, uh, it's very cold, barren. It's just south of Fort McMurray, where there is nothing up there. It snows in June. It's a nightmare. Uh, so it's interesting that you had that experience up there. Uh, my experiences really in the global community really happened when I left Canada and actually came to New York City to go to school. And that's ultimately where I really met the world. Uh, and it wasn't even during school. I mean, of course, when you come here to New York and you uh, experience the subways, you see every kind of uh, person that walking the earth. And as an artist, as a visual person, you just want to paint it all. You want to draw it all. You want to see it all. You want to do it. You want to experience it all. Um, but that becomes a problem because you can't do that. Uh, ultimately, for every painter, you should try to paint everything in a single picture. Um, but you have to work in terms of a metaphor. But anyways, pass, and we'll talk more about that. But um, my real experience actually came when I graduated school and had to work as a room service waiter in the hotels in New York City. And that's where I met the world. And that was a curious uh, experience. Uh, the one guy that became was a friend of mine, uh, of mine today uh, was one of the boat people, Kim Dang. And uh, his story of uh, escaping the North Vietnamese Army, he's my age. Uh, and riding in a boat for six days across the South China Sea, holy cow. The friend that became my uh, best man at my wedding, his father drowned beside him on his way from Haiti to America. I mean, these are the stories. They're my age. At the time they were experiencing these things, I was thinking about where I can get money for beer for the weekend. Like, there's almost no comparison between my experiences and their experiences growing up. But as a painter, uh, these things that wash into you, and as a creative person, you have to find a way to, uh, to try to describe it. And I want you all to think about the idea of the metaphor and what that means, and, I, and I'll explain it in a second uh, in a larger way. But it's the idea that you give expression and shape to things not in a literal fashion. I guess it's a bit of a fic visual fictitious story. Um, these are really big paintings. They're from the floor to the much higher than the ceiling and wider. And, with the dim lights, they all look so impressive. Mm -hmm. But the idea here is that in all of our experiences in our lives, we're all, you just undeniable a fact that we're shaped by so many events and situations that, uh, that we have no control over whatsoever. Somebody said something to you in the 10th grade and, and it blew your mind, it changed everything. You broke a leg here, you met somebody in the hospital. It's, it's fantastic, these pivotal events that cannot be planned, you just deal with them. Now, my task is how do you make a picture of those things? And uh, ultimately, these became what they were. Uh, the first one was called Tribulations. Uh, this one's called The Message. They're these vast landscapes with these crumpled up fabric abstractions. But uh, the idea is that was what that impact had to me when you stand in front of these huge things, this awesome moment. I mean, it's not going to have a picture literally describing your mother whispering in your ear or something. It just has to be something larger than that. But it was my way of being able to maybe connect with uh, people in their fantastic stories where they would see something else in these things that I wouldn't. This is the petition. Uh, this one's called the promise. And you know, I, I just started painting these things. This is the thing as a painter, you paint first and try to figure them out later. Everything begins with an image of which you have no idea what the metaphor is for at all. Uh, but as I look back on them, I guess I see the Canadian prairies, the landscapes in there. My parents are from Saskatchewan in Canada. And it's so flat there, they say that if your dog runs away, you don't have to worry because you can still see him running for three days. <laughs> so that's where the landscape came in from. Right? Uh, this is. This was a warning, this dark, crumpled thing, a warning, a foreboding, a, you know, I don't know. Um, this was a secret, but uh, I'm going to tell you a, a thing, and I, I got to say, my classes at St. John's University look exactly like this right here. So I want you to imagine, and I give this task out to all my students all the time. Think of yourself if you could come up with a metaphor, a visual image of something that represents everything that you are, everything that you hope to be, everything that you wish you were. Everything in a single picture, the totality of you, your hopes and dreams and everything, in a sim, sim, single image. Think about that. I got to tell you, when I do that project, it's amazing how many metaphors I see of caged birds. You know, especially people that come from very poor countries around the world that have so much talent. 
but their parents aren't going to let them be an artist. So they're in the chemistry labs, things like that, but they take the occasional art class with me, and that's where I get the caged bird metaphors. The problem with being an artist is what Albert Einstein said about being a scientist. It's a wonderful thing until you have to make a living at it. I'm going to show you my metaphor. This is the one I showed my students. In 19 seconds, I'm going to show you my entire life. And the reality is the first 10 seconds. First 10 seconds, pure reality, brutal. The last nine seconds is everything I hope to be. Every, I hope it all works out. Let's see if it's going to go. Oh, it's a video, but I don't know if it's going to play. But it's okay, because I could probably just explain it anyways. Oh, I'm not going to get it. It doesn't play. All right, I'll explain it to you. So in the first 10 seconds, you see this bull. It's this grainy picture from, I don't know, Spain in the 1950s. But he's just chewing up these matadors. He's just stomping and throwing them around and just killing them, right? And, uh, and it's the first 10 seconds. And they're running. They're trying to handle them. And this bull is just crushing them. It's awesome. And the last night, they cut to another frame. And it's the master matador with the same bull. And he's doing this bullfight dance. The bull's trying to kill him. And he's with the thing. And then the bull just stops. And he kneels down on one knee. And he throws the thing away. And he touches the bull's horns. Like, wow. <laughs> so that was my thing. But it all brings you to this point with the struggle with reality. And this is the thing, uh, teaching art and being in the arts. It is a wonderful thing until you've got to make a living at it. And it's uh, really a patronized thing as well. I, they, they tell me that in Europe they have more respect for the arts. The hot dog vendor knows what's going on in the Tate and whatever. But then I have people from overseas say, nah, it's not like that at all. They don't know anything either. But uh, this is the thing. Beyond that, making a living and dealing with the world around you becomes the issue. This is a painting I did a couple of years ago called The 99%. So this is less of a metaphor, more of a ramification of events. This is 1%. The 1%. See the 1%? They have the milk. But you're using these things as metaphors to talk about larger issues, more politically charged events that happen around the world. How does that look back there, by the way? Can you see that? Can you make that out? It's like a bit of a bomb, explosion, people running, madness. And you know, when you start to delve into this type of subject matter where you sink yourself into the events of the world, uh, and as a painter, by the way, you, go, you do this alone. I don't, I don't talk. There's no talking. Even as I'm teaching, I'm just working on a kid's vein. There's no talking. Uh, you work in <coughs> silence, and you spend a lot of time alone, and uh, it can get dark as you start to imagine how the world is. And the whole point of being a painter is making sense of the world around you. This, my dealer in New York refused to show this painting. It was just a still life of an improvised explosive device, just called IED-1. It's not real. It can't blow up. But uh, you know, after all the goings on and things like that, I started doing still lives of bombs and things. <laughs> And uh, he's like, what, what are you do why are you doing this? Don't do this. <laughs> I'm like, OK, what if, what if I do this? Well, I don't really know what's going on, but it's okay. But if you remember those pictures, those horrible pictures of people getting their heads cut off on TV and how, how incredibly r ridiculous that scenario was, he thought, oh, that's okay. Right? My first trip to uh, Italy, I got very depressed. Those of you that come from very culturally rich nations, uh, when I go back to Italy and you see the masters, the Caravaggios, all that, naturally you get very depressed because it seems that there is a level of professionalism and excellence that I am not entitled to. I have no way of getting to those levels. Very depressing, very sad. Why not just quit? If you're not good enough, you can't be that, whatever. My second trip to Italy, I saw a window. Because I was in St. Peter's, and you know how they have all the saints along the aisles. And St. John's University is a Vincentian uh, society that founded that school. And they have a mask of his. He died in the 1700s, so they preserved a mask on his face. You could see what he looked like. When I saw the Versace model on the side of St. Peter's, I'm like, he didn't look like that because I painted him, I know. He was a very ugly man. <laughs> and I realized, oh, those are idealized forms. That's the ideal of prayer and piety. That's what they're trying to communicate. But that's not real. That's not how you and I pray. We pray in the dark crying because something bad is happening tomorrow. Uh, and even how the depictions of ancient, the ancient things, particularly the ancient gods in Rome, the god of war, 
Mars. If you've ever seen any depictions of the god of war, he's young, he's handsome, he's muscular, and uh, he's all, you know, with the women and everything. He's just this glorified god, right? It's the god of war. I think in our day and age, if there is a god of war, he's probably a sick old man that just randomly runs around with his sowing discord randomly. So that's where this series came from, of Mars. But this is how I saw a window into how I can escape the shadows of the ancients by dealing with our everyday ordinary experiences in a metaphorical sense. This is my son. Uh, I did a bunch of pictures of kids crying and screaming just as a further metaphor for the misery of our situation. And it's kind of funny to think about it because I realized with my kids, uh, the way to stop them from crying is to try to make them cry, <laughs> ironically. So now whenever I said, oh, daddy's gonna pay, you're crying, they stop crying. So I'm now, this is my thing, and now I have no more models because they know the trick is up, right? But this idea of fighting and struggling, conflict, and this is where boxing became a huge metaphor, fighting, right? We all have to fight. This is our struggle in life. Largely, of course, the struggle is more internal than external, although in many cases it is external, right? A friend of mine used to say, she said, why are you, why are you painting all these fighters, all these guys boxing? Why are you doing that? It's such a dumb thing, these meatheads in the ring. I thought, you know what, if that's all there is to it, then I would agree with you. But if you took all the struggles of your life and you compressed them down into 12 three-minute rounds, you tell me you wouldn't get a bloody nose? You wouldn't be knocked out? Somebody would be hurt? And I've, if I think about a top prize fighter in this profession has maybe three major fights in, his, in a year. Think about in your life how many major conflicts you have in a year, a thing you really gotta deal with and it's gonna just exhaust you. Those are those major conflicts. Only unfortunately with them, they're spanned out in three minutes. I can handle three minutes. Yours are some of them are like three years, <coughs> 10 years, maybe less, maybe more. But the metaphor for fighting, and that's where it brings you to your, some of your heroes like Muhammad Ali, right? It was one of my very first early heroes, that guy. He stood for something larger than the sport itself. He saw a bigger picture in it all of it. But that brings us to my final thing here and what you do and what you choose to do and the struggles that you have to deal with actually just to be an artist at all. Uh, you know, when I was in school, uh, there was a teacher that, and some of you may have experienced this, he said, I want all of you to write down the most important things in your life, the top three or four things. Write them all down in a list, and then you're going to make a picture of them. But your list, and you know, you start off, uh, there's God, there's my family, there's art, there's that, 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 that. It's years later that I'm in this now, and there's no reason for a list. They can all be number one, because they're all interrelated and dependent on each other. Your family, your faith, your friends, all of that relate to each other. And it has to be this holistic approach. The lie that's told to the contemporary artist is this. In order to be a good artist, you have to remove yourself from the distractions of life. Don't have a family, don't have kids, don't do any of that, so you have time to do your art. My question to that is, if you remove yourself from the struggles of life, what are you going to make pictures of? I notice this about myself, is that if things are going good and I've sold a few paintings and things are I'm not painting, I'm having fun. It's when things are terrible and miserable, and that's why I paint. That's why you go into this place to exercise these demons, to work these things out, right? To get release from your anxieties and your stress. It's not necessarily about therapy either. It's a confrontation and a way of making sense of the world around you. And I think everybody in here does this in their own idiom. Mine is making pictures. I realize I'm up here talking now, but I can honestly trace 95% of the anxiety and misery in my life come from words coming out of my mouth. It's my mouth gets me into trouble all the time. And when I realized that, they called me and said, you want to teach? At the exact same time I made that realization that I should never speak, I got a teaching job. What does that say? Right? But anyways, back to this thing where you have to transform this part of yourself and you're dealing with the world around you. This is a little series I did on these back to the bulls and the fighting and all of that. Now that we don't have the, uh, the fighting anymore with the bulls and they're free, there's a, there's a certain metaphorical thing that happens when you have to deal with the sacrifice, not only just animals, but most especially people, and that's what they're really metaphors, those great influential people in your lives. How do you make a picture of all their struggles and all their victories and all of their defeats? All right? If I was to make a picture of everything in my life that's absolutely horrible and everything that's wonderful as well, it would look like that. And you know, when we're talking about stories and things like that, I guess at the end of the day, that's all you have left, right? 
There's these big monsters running around. I think I had a note on that, but I can't remember what it was. Uh, it doesn't matter. Right? These wonderful animals. This is where I am now. Right? Gold sparkling all over. Freedom nice. <laughs> right? You know, it's because of these things, it's ironic. I, you know, you see a very dark period in there, which is always there. But uh, all the paintings build on top of each other. There's a wonderful line from Einstein again. He, somebody said, oh, you're so smart. Why are you so smart? Not really. I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. And the thing about being an artist and a painter, and you might see this, especially early ages is, uh, of the artist, is everything starts to progress and build on itself. Hopper, a famous artist, used to say, the last works of an artist you can see when they're children. Uh, the roots of where they ended up being. It never changes. So this expansion into the florals and things like that is a natural thing. But it still carries with it the metaphors. This is Fratres. This is a giant floral painting I did. But it's me and my two brothers. Which, incidentally, by the way, as a little anecdote, I was thinking about this on the way in, about people if they can't really understand English. I come from, I'm French Canadian, we're, we're raised in the west of Canada. Me and my two brothers cannot put together a single French sentence to save our lives. And we all studied French our entire life. And we're all teachers. We're just not French teachers. Right? Well, yeah, I, I, I show that in there just because of my motivation. But I'll give you a quick look again. I was thinking it's so ridiculous. But that's the portrait of me and my family. But if you look at it, it's like a flower, only the center is not smiling. Somebody pointed that out to me. Oh, yeah, well, that makes complete sense. Anyways, oh, I forgot to mention, if you had any questions, you could just shoot them out at any time. But I guess we're done, so. I got to tell you, thank you very much for your question. That's a great point, because that's the whole thing. I've come to the conclusion, and St. John's University represents uh, probably the mo most diverse campus, culturally speaking, in the history of the world. There's more people from around the world there than any other point in time. And from being there for the last 15 years, I can honestly say that I've been able to derive some conclusions, one of which everybody learns how to draw the same way. You all draw the same way. Oh, I can't draw. No, you just didn't put the time in like everybody else did. But the other thing is that our common ground between us all uh, is, is so much more of a worthwhile, uh, let me put it this way. We have so much more in common, no matter where you're from, than we have not in common. And art has a way of crossing over those things. And music does it as well. You know, great music really doesn't have, it, it can, but it, it will touch strings within anybody from another planet. And the visual arts especially, and that's why I started off with those fabric uh, 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 abstractions in the sky. Some cultures really resent having figurative representations in their art. But really, when you get into still life or things like that that speak about a metaphor, you can have a lot of connections going on. But as far as my hopes for it, I got to tell you, when I punish my kids now, well, from the beginning, uh, if they're bad, they sit in the corner and they, they sit for a drawing. They get drawn by me. So they've already, at a very young age, associate art with punishment. Do you know what I mean? Uh, this is the thing you have to kind of wrap your head around. And going back to the idea of drawing, it's a total commitment. This is your life. This is who you are. The good news for me is I'm even worse at anything else. This is all I got. I got to make this work. You saw those mouths I got to feed? It's on. This is it. I can't go to law school and become a lawyer. When I teach students that have so many talents, they can draw, they can paint, they're good in science, they're good in math, I know they're not going to be an artist. because. The arts take amount of time where you have to develop yourself before any money comes in, any, any sustainability comes in. And there's too many opportunities to make a living anywhere else, and I know they're gone. I heard somebody say, a friend of mine that was an actor, he said, yeah, to be an actor, you have to just be terrible at everything. You can't even wait tables, you can't take an order, you, have, you can be just terrible at everything. And that's the only hope you have. And I, I guess there's something kind of good in that, in a, in a way that whatever obscure talent you have, well, at least you got that. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs>